Okay, so <clears throat> what I'd like to go over first with you is uh, the questions that I know is on everyone's mind. Hey, Doc, can you tell me uh, what we need to know for next week's exam? I'd like for you to put me at ease. Can you give me the breakdown? Can you tell me the models? How many questions? How much time? So <clears throat> next week, um, again, like all other exams have started, they have all started promptly at 2.30. The timer actually starts at 2.30, just like all of your exams have. There have been a number of students that were aware, or at least the class should have been aware of those instructions, and yet some students have shown up 20 minutes late, 30 minutes late to log in, and unfortunately, what happens is there's 55 minutes to take the exam and at the end of 55 minutes, the exam just shuts or locks down. And what happens is students will start sending me emails, hey doc, I don't see any images. Why is that? They just disappear. And that is because the timer, the time has lapsed. Now, one of the other things that has me a little bit concerned is when I look at the test analytics and some students have run out of time, I'm noticing that students aren't spending the typical 45 seconds to one minute per question. They're six to seven minutes on a particular question. Now, what does that tell me? When a student is spending six to seven minutes on a question, it's not because the student is diving deep into their mind and thinking about an answer. It's researching and using other resources that takes multiple minutes to come up with that answer. So I want you to be very, very careful with that. We see the analytics and the typical average time per question is somewhere between 45 seconds to one minute. Historically, that is the best practice for most exams is a minute per question. Unless of course it's an essay, then that's, that's something completely different. Um, so I want you to be careful with the amount of time that you're spending. If, if you're spending five or six minutes on one particular question, you will run out of time because it's set up for about a minute per question, just a little bit over. Okay, the second thing I wanted to discuss with you is that this exam is similar to all of the rest with one slight change. On all other exams, there are typically, at least the bone exam and the muscle exam, there were 50 questions, and there are also 50 questions on this exam. On the bone exam and the muscle exam, there were 50 in the individual questions, 50 individual pictures. Each picture had its own question. On this exam, there are 25 models, 25 stations, only 25 pictures. On each picture, there's an A and a B question. There's always two questions per picture. <clears throat> the majority of the questions are structurally related. I would say more than 95% of the exam are identified. There are maybe two questions or so, maybe three at best, that are functionally related. So again, 25 pictures, two questions per, one of them may be identifying, one of them may be a functional, or one of them is not related to the picture at all. One of the questions may just be a question that's not related to the picture, but I promise you there are always two questions on each picture. Two times 25 is 50. Again, you can only move forward and you can't move forward and backward on this exam like all the exams, you can only progress forward. If you don't know it, put something down, try. Because I do go through all of the exams 
individually. I look at all of your individual answers. And if there's a way I can give half a point, one point, a quarter of a point, something is better than putting nothing if I feel it's related. Okay. Um, when and if there are cranial nerve questions, you have to know the 12 cranial nerves. You have to know their names and Roman numeral. There are about three questions on cranial nerves. Two of them are pure structural and identification. One of them will be functional. And I'll go through some of the functions of the cranial nerves in today's um, lab lecture when I cover the brain. On the neuron, on the neuron, there are about four questions on the neuron. On the brain, there'll be about 12 questions on the brain. On the spinal cord, and when I say spinal cord, I'm referring to the cross-sectional view of the spinal cord, the one that has the vertebra and the white matter and gray matter and dorsal root ganglion, anterior horns, dorsal horns, all of those, there'll be about eight questions on, on the, those models. On the ventricles, which lie within the brain, there are four ventricles and two chambers, or I should say four ventricles and, and two um, foramen in which the cerebral spinal fluid travel through. Um, there'll be about four questions on the ventricles. On flat Stanley that we did last week, flat Stanley was the model that had the nerves. Uh, for the upper extremity, it was the axillary nerve, median nerve, radial nerve, ulnar nerve. Uh, we did the cervical plexus, brachial plexus, lower back was lumbar plexus, so sciatic nerve. So that big board, there'll be about eight questions on those nerves from that alone. On the reflex arc, there'll be about four questions. On the spinal cord, but the torso model, the one that showed the spine from the back view with some of the muscles dissected that showed the uh, cervical enlargement and the pia mater and the arachnoid and the corda equina and phylum terminale. There'll be two questions from that model. Today, we're gonna be doing the special senses. I'll cover the eye. There'll be about two to three questions on the eye. And on the ear, there'll be about three to four questions on the ear. That's gonna be what your exam looks like, the breakdown of that. So Keep that aside, and then after today's lecture, you can go through that and start looking at some of those PDFs and models and start studying around that, okay? What I'd like to do now is we're looking at this PDF on the anatomy of the brain. It has, uh, looks like 37 slides. If I don't mention or cover the anatomical structure and I pass it, I'm passing it with the intent of passing it. I'm doing it on purpose because I don't think it's relevant or important to know. So there's no need to say, Doc, you missed one or you didn't mention that one. Does that mean that you're not holding us accountable? That's exactly what it means, okay? So let's take a look at uh, this first view of the brain and uh, this is a superior view. We're looking straight down on it. You can see that there are two hemispheres. Now, since this is the front and this is the posterior, this is the left hemisphere of the cerebrum, and this is the right hemisphere of the cerebrum. And on each of these hemispheres, we see mountains and valleys. These mountains or the hills 
are referred to as a gyrus. And then we have the valleys, the depressions between, are referred to as sulcus. The left hemisphere of the brain, as you learned in lecture, and if not, I'm sure that you will, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere have different functions. The left hemisphere is more linear. Its left is more linear. Its language, its science, its math, its logic, all of that is the left side of the brain. Whereas your right side of the brain is more creative. It's more artistic, explorative. It's more music and art. It's facial recognition. It's it's a degree of language, but not so much in terms of verbal communication. It's more language in reference to the tone and how you use your voice. Where some people speak like this, they are very robotic when they communicate, and it would be very boring listening to me speak and teach all term if I spoke like this. This would mean that there is a lesion somewhere in the right side of my brain. But if I talk, and I communicate and I use different tones and can bring emotion to how I speak, that is a healthy right side of the brain. So <clears throat> now we're looking at the individual who's looking at us in anatomical position. So we have a right cerebral hemisphere and a left cerebral hemisphere. Notice the word cerebral refers to cerebrum. There is a frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, temporal lobe of the cerebrum. So it's cerebral hemisphere, not to be confused with cerebellar hemisphere. When we do the cerebellum, we would refer to that as a cerebellar hemisphere, not cerebral hemisphere. Just don't want you to confuse them. If you remember from last week, when we looked at the cross section of the spinal cord, there was the butterfly, the letter H in the middle of the spinal cord. And we said that was gray matter. And we said that what surrounded the gray matter was white matter. That's why we had the columns, the white posterior columns, the lateral columns, and the anterior columns. Those were myelinated. Those were white matter. And the white matter was on the outside, the periphery of the spinal cord, whereas the gray matter was on the inside of the spinal cord. And the reason why I bring that to your memory and recall is when you look at the brain, it's exactly the opposite, where the inner part of the brain is white matter and the outer part of the brain, that's the cortex of the cerebrum, cerebral cortex, this is all gray matter. So gray matter on the outside, white matter on the inside, but on the spinal cord, it's exactly the opposite. When you look at the brain again, white matter on the inside, gray matter, which is the cerebral cortex on the outer portion, myelinated on the inside, unmyelinated on the outside. You should have learned in lecture or you will learn in lecture that there are different neuroglial cells, oligodendrocytes, Schwann cells, ependymal cells, microglial cells, those hopefully should sound a little bit familiar to you. The type of neuroglial cell or nerve glue cell, the type of neuroglial cell that is responsible for myelinating in the central neural system in the CNS, that's called an oligodendrocyte. But the cell that myelinates and lays down myelin sheath in the PNS or peripheral neural system, that is the Schwann cell. So Schwann cells and oligodendrocytes have the same function, but it's like real estate, location, location, location. Where do they myelinate? The oligodendrocyte myelinates in the CNS, the Schwann cell myelinates in the PNS. When we look at the two cerebral hemispheres, you'll see that there is a fissure that runs in alignment with the sagittal suture. Think back to the osteology when we did the bones. There was the sagittal suture, coronal suture, lambdoidal suture, squamous suture. So the 
sagittal suture runs anterior to posterior. That's where we have the longitudinal fissure, which kind of acts as that delineation of separation between the two cerebral hemispheres. This is a bird's eye view. It's a superior view looking down on top of the brain superficially. I will go over the red structure and the blue structure in a few minutes. Now this is the top of the skull. This would be the part of the parietal bone, yeah. but we're looking at it from the inside. If you can please mute your mic, it would be greatly appreciated. If you look at this structure, you'll see through the bone, right? Translucently through this, you could see some veins. You could see some blue structures. These are uh, very important venous structures that you will learn in anatomy and physiology too. And they're important to drain the brain and bring the deoxygenated blood from the brain and try and deliver it to the heart. The heart's job would then be to deliver and pump that deoxygenated blood that needs oxygen from the heart to the lungs. And then there would be a way of delivering the oxygenated blood back up to the brain. And once that, those red blood cells are bringing oxygen and dumping it in the brain for fuel, then the blood becomes deoxygenated again. And then we have to find a way of bringing it back to the heart. So this is the superior sagittal sinus. Looks like the large part of the rainbow. Then the, the other part of the double rainbow is the inferior sagittal sinus. Then we have a straight sinus and a transverse sinus. So they drain the deoxygenated blood. Eventually it makes it to this transverse sinus and blood will find its way into the jugular vein and the jugular vein will send it back to the heart. You will see that entire circulatory route next term in AMP2, AHS 132. Okay, so this was the longitudinal fissure. Now we have a fissure that separates the occipital lobe of the, of the cerebrum. This is the occipital lobe. This is the cerebellum. This is the left cerebellar hemisphere. This is the right cerebellar hemisphere. Between the occipital lobe of the cerebrum and the two cerebellar hemispheres is another fissure that runs transversely. So it's called the transverse fissure. As I said before, the occipital bone is back here. So this is the occipital lobe. This happens to be the primary center for vision. The fact that you can see each other means that your optic nerve, cranial nerve two, is relaying the information that the eyes picked up in the receptor and is sending it back here to the occipital lobe to the visual center. And it is this center, the visual center of the brain that actually does the seeing. It is not your eyes that do the seeing. It is the occipital lobe, the primary visual center back here that actually does the seeing. The eyes only have the receptor. And then it will relay that information to the adjacent green area. That's the association visual center. The fact that you can see someone means that the visual center is working. But if you were to see someone like an actor or an actress somewhere in the streets and you go, oh, I see them. Then you go, oh, where do I know them from? It relays that information to the association area that does more processing to interpret that information. So you know who that person is.
Now the tentorum cerebelli is this clear translucent membrane. The tentorum cerebelli is actually what it is the membrane, not the fissure, but it is the membrane that's located between the cerebellum and the occipital lobe. The actual gap or space is the transverse fissure, but the membrane that actually separates the two is called the tentorum cerebelli. Now, I promised you that I would go over the red and the blue strip, what these were. Before I get into them, we have to go over this sulcus. The sulcus that runs here and goes all the way down to the temporal lobe on this side, and the sulcus that starts here and goes all the way down the temporal lobe on this side is called a central sulcus. It's a very, very important landmark the central sulcus. Because if you know that this is the central sulcus, it helps you name the structure that comes before it and the structure that comes after it, behind it. The structure that comes in front of it, let me show you again. We're looking at the same part here, but now we're looking at it from the lateral view. This is the frontal lobe of the brain. So this is the anterior part. Here's the green. This is the occipital lobe. This is posterior. We could see the central sulcus once again. Now we see it from the lateral side going all the way down right there to the beginning of the temporal lobe, which is the orange and the yellow. That's your temporal lobe. Once you know that this is the central sulcus, we can then name the red structure, the pre-central gyrus. And if this is the pre-central gyrus, the blue is the post-central gyrus. Pre is before, post is after. Pre is before, this is the front, post behind, posterior. Pre-central gyrus, post-central gyrus. From a functional perspective, the pre-central gyrus is where all of your motor motor information begins. Meaning if you want to move your arm or extend your leg or dorsiflex or plantar flex your foot, all that motor command information starts here. And maybe the foot is controlled by this part of the precentral gyrus. Maybe your arm is controlled by this part. Maybe your lips and face are controlled by here. So each region is quite specific for a different part of the body for both motor control and sensory. So the precentral gyrus is where your motor control is initiated and your postcentral gyrus is where all of your sensory input that came into your body, where it ends up. And again, Maybe you having a certain sensation of your feet comes from here. Maybe what controls and feeling something that touched your shoulder can be felt from here. Maybe someone touching your lips can be felt because it's sensed here. So if you were to look in your lecture book or your lab book and you look up the term homunculus, homunculus, that is the very awkward looking picture of a human being stretched completely over the pre and post central gyrus. You'll see that the eyes are very big, the lips are very big, the fingers are very big, the toes are very big. And that's because those very small parts of the body occupy a lot of brain power to coordinate and move these very small muscles like the eye muscles or the lips, the, the muscles of the lips or the muscle of your pinky. And the same thing is true on the sensory part. The feet are highly sensitive. The toes are highly sensitive. The fingers, the lips, all super sensitive in terms of sensory, right? It's not like large muscles like the quadriceps or the hamstrings take up a lot of neurological space in the brain. It's the areas that sometimes have the smallest muscles that are more controlling precision 
that occupy a lot of brain space. So you have the central sulcus, precentral gyrus in front, and postcentral gyrus in the back of it. The postcentral gyrus is called the primary somatosensory area because it's somatosensory, sensory from the body. And then we have somatic motor, your primary somatic motor area. This is your motor strip. This is your sensory strip. The motor, the, the precentral gyrus, is part of the frontal lobe. This is the frontal lobe of the brain. The postcentral gyrus is part of the parietal lobe of the brain. Back here was the occipital lobe. Here is your temporal lobe. Occipital is for vision. Temporal lobe is for hearing. Frontal lobe is mostly your ambition, your drive, your personality. Are you inspired, right? When you can self-motivate, you have a good frontal lobe. When you constantly need to push from others to do something, frontal lobe is not working the best. It needs to be recalibrated. Frontal lobe is also responsible for inhibiting certain things like you shouldn't push your little brother down the stairs or your little sister down the stairs. So you may want to do that. You may be so angry, you may want to punch someone or push someone, but a healthy frontal lobe does some calculations and says, you know what, if I do that, that's going to get me in trouble. If I get caught cheating on this exam, this will stick with me the rest of my college career. So maybe I won't do that. It may pass me in anatomy, but when I get the pathophysiology in the nursing program, oh my God, I'm gonna get slammed because I didn't learn anatomy the first time, right? So the healthy frontal lobe says, I won't use any resources. Let me do the very best I can do. A frontal lobe in a baby or an infant is not really developed. So it can't inhibit the baby's urge to urinate. That's why babies wear diapers. It can't inhibit or stop the baby from having a bowel movement. That's why they wear diapers. So in the baby, the frontal lobe hasn't really developed until the age of three, four, five. So they need diapers. And the same thing is true with senior citizens. Sometimes the brain goes through a neurological breakdown when they get older. And then they have to wear a diaper again because they can't control the urination or bowel movements. So a healthy brain has healthy autonomic function, healthy heart, healthy lungs, healthy digestion, healthy bowel movements, urination. When those things start to break down, it means the brain is breaking down. So frontal lobe is designed to inhibit behavior. You may want to do something, but you can think it through and go, probably not the best thing for me to do that. The parietal lobe deals with your proprioception, your awareness. This is when my patient says to me, hey, Dr. Lindner, look at my left ankle. It looks swollen compared to my right ankle. And to me, maybe it looks fine. Maybe they look symmetrical. And I say, you know, I'm sorry, but I don't see it. The ankles, both your ankles are the same size. No, doc, doc, look. Look at my left ankle and look at my left wrist. Oh my God, it's so much fatter than the right. It's swollen, it's puffy, it's big. I'm going, listen, they look the same to me. In fact, let's take a tape measure. Let's measure your left ankle. Let's compare it to the right. Hmm, interesting. Your left ankle measures eight centimeters and your right ankle is eight centimeters. What does that mean to you? And the patient says, well, it means they're the same size. But look, doc, I swear, look at that. Look, I know the measurement says that, but look, it's just bigger. That means there, there's a problem in that postcentral gyrus and how their body perceives and sees itself, a body image disorder. Okay. Temporal lobe is hearing, occipital lobe is vision, parietal lobe is awareness of your body and its parts, frontal lobe is your personality. It's your drive, your ambition, the center that inhibits things, slows down the heart rate when the baby gets older. 
the baby can determine that, hmm, I have to go to the bathroom now, so they don't need a diaper anymore. When we look underneath the brain, we can see the brain stem. This is the medulla, this is the pons, and this is the midbrain. Those three parts make up the brain stem. You don't have to write that right now because it's coming up labeled, but I just like to point it out a few times. Medulla, pons, midbrain. Everything yellow is nerves. The two that stick out the most to me up here, this is for the sense of smell. That's your olfactory nerve or the olfactory tract. And the very, very tip is the olfactory bulb. The olfactory bulb has extensions that go through the cribiform plate, the cella tersica. Remember that when we did osteology, that was important. So olfactory bulb, olfactory tract. This is called the optic nerve. The optic nerve is cranial nerve two. The olfactory nerve is cranial nerve one. Your cranial nerves are named and numbered in the order that they are actually developed. So the first cranial nerve that develops embryologically is olfactory nerve, cranial nerve one. The second cranial nerve that develops is cranial nerve two, the optic nerve, okay? Where both optic nerves crisscross, they make an X, like they decussate, right there is called the optic chiasm, the optic chiasm, ending in an M. Some slides call it the optic chiasma. I like and prefer the optic chiasm. It's the X or the crisscross. Again, I've covered this in the previous slide, but here you have it labeled. So here's your frontal lobe, we discussed its function. Parietal lobe, we discussed its function. Occipital lobe and temporal lobe. The precentral gyrus is part of the frontal lobe. The postcentral gyrus is part of the parietal lobe. There's the central sulcus that delineates and separates the two. Here's your temporal lobe for hearing. And here's the occipital lobe for vision. Here's your precentral gyrus. I told you before that that's your primary motor area. And then here we said the postcentral gyrus, and that is your primary sensory area. Here is your occipital lobe in the back, primary visual cortex. If you slip and bang the back of your head against the concrete, you can go blind because that's the part that is respons responsible for allowing you to see. It's not your eyes. Your eyes do not do the seeing. It's almost like saying your skin does the feeling in your fingertips. It doesn't. Your fingertip has a receptor. It sends the message to the postcentral gyrus. Your brain feels the pain. Your eyes have the receptor sends the signals into the occipital lobe that says, hey, I can see. Then it relays it to the visual association area for you to interpret what it is you're seeing. The temporal lobe has the primary auditory cortex. This allows you to hear. This is where the vestibulocochlea nerve, which is cranial nerve eight, vestibulocochlear, the cochlear portion deals with hearing, the vestibular portion deals with your sense of balance. So it brings it to the auditory cortex. So you could say, I hear something, but now the association area is what interprets, oh, that's Dr. Lindner's voice, he's teaching. No, he's not singing, he's teaching. You can, your auditory associ association area can tell the difference between you know, Frank Sinatra's voice and mine. It can interpret the difference between someone talking to you or singing to you. Okay, inside the brain, deep, there's an orange area here called the insula. The insula is inside. It's part of this diencephalon region, which we'll get into now. 
So everything in here, what we did here is we took the left and right cerebral hemisphere and separated them. And this is the right cerebral hemisphere, but the medial portion of it. We're looking at it from the inside. So this region that looks all white on the inside, this is part of the diencephalon. Okay. The corpus callosum is a group of axons that connect the left and right cerebral hemisphere to one another, and they allow both sides of the brain to communicate with one another. That's what the corpus callosum does. The septum pellucidum is this clear translucent membrane that separates both ventricles from one another. The, the lateral ventricle one from lateral ventricle two, we'll see the ventricles in just a minute. But septum means wall, like a nasal septum. Inferior to that right here, above this structure, which is called the choroid plexus, above the choroid plexus is the fornix. This lower portion is the brainstem, medulla, pons, and midbrain. Medulla, pons, and midbrain. When we look again in this version of the brain, here's the corpus callosum, there's the septum pellucidum, and on one side of the brain, is one of the lateral ventricles where cerebral spinal fluid travels. And on the other side, the other half, would be the other lateral ventricle. So there's two lateral ventricles, one in each hemisphere of the brain. Again, the uh, blue structure is the choroid plexus. It's a vascular system around the ventricles. And above that is the fornix. Here is the medulla, pons, and midbrain. Back here is the cerebellum. It looks like a leaf, the veins of a leaf known as the arbor vitae. And then the gray matter surrounding that is called folia, like foliage of a leaf. I'm gonna skip this. Okay, again, corpus callosum, septum pellucidum, choroid plexus. Now we have the thalamus. The thalamus is the large almond structure with the yellow being the interthalamic adhesion, the interthalamic adhesion. The thalamus is the primary relay station for all of your sensory input. Every sensory input that comes in to the brain is relayed. It comes up through the medulla, through the pons, through the midbrain, and it synapses or is relayed to the thalamus. And then the thalamus says, okay, we are going to send this up to the postcentral gyrus. And this information is coming from the eyes or this sensory information is coming from the feet, right? So it's gonna relay the sensory input to the postcentral gyrus. The thalamus is the relay for all the sensory input except the sense of smell. The sense of smell does not go to the thalamus. Again, medulla, pons, midbrain. Under the thalamus, again, under, under the thalamus is hypothalamus. This is the hypothalamus. It's under the thalamus. The thalamus is going to control the autonomic neural system, the ANS. When I talk about the ANS, you should think sympathetic and parasympathetic. The hypothalamus regulates your body temperature. The hypothalamus controls your mood. It controls your hunger, your satiety, your thirst, when you're hungry, when you're thirsty, when you're full, all of that is hypothalamus. Here is the thalamus again. That's the interthalamic adhesion. Under the thalamus is the hypothalamus. 
And there's a connection from the hypothalamus into number 16, which is the pituitary gland. The connection is through the infundibulum. The infundibulum is also known as the stalk. So hypothalamus connects to the pituitary by way of the infundibulum. Notice where the pituitary gland actually sits. It rests in this bony cavity. The bony cavity is known as the cella tersica. That should sound familiar. I made sure I put it on your exam too for bones. Also known as the hypophyseal fossa. It's called the hypophyseal fossa because when you get into AMP2, you will learn about the pituitary's anterior and posterior portion. And the anterior portion is known as the adeno hypothesis. And the posterior portion is the neuro hypothesis. So this is the hypophyseal fossa that contains the pituitary gland. Not to be confused with the pineal gland, which is back here, just above the cerebellum. That's pineal, that's pituitary. Here's your thalamus, the interthalmic adhesion, choroid plexus, which is going to be this vascular system around the lateral ventricles. And there's your pineal gland. Medulla, pons, midbrain. Here's your choroid plexus, interthalmic adhesion, thalamus, hypothalamus. There's your pineal gland back here. This is your corpus callosum, septum pellucidum, fornix. Now you have the brain stem labeled medulla, pons, and midbrain. We're gonna be looking at a picture of the midbrain soon where not just the right hemisphere, but the left hemisphere, we're gonna rotate this around so we can get a better look at these two bumps in the back. Because these two bumps, along with the other two bumps on the other cerebral hemisphere make up four bumps. And it's important that we know what those look like and what they do. So medulla oblongata, pons, and the midbrain. Now we rotated this to the posterior so we can see these four bumps. The four bumps, there's two on the top and two on the bottom. We were just looking at half of it. We were looking at these two. So now we see the superior colliculi and the inferior colliculi. So superior colliculus, both, inferior colliculus, both. Otherwise it's a superior colliculi, inferior colliculi. When we're talking about both, it's a superior colliculus and inferior colliculus. Superior colliculus, inferior colliculus, these four structures combined is referred to as the corpora quadrigemina. Quad is four. Corpora, corp is body, body of four. Visual input for your eyes go into the superior colliculus, auditory input goes into the inferior colliculus. Again, medulla, pons, midbrain. Occipital lobe of the cerebrum, cerebellum. The two hemispheres of the cerebellum are connected by the vermis in the center. Right cerebellar hemisphere, left cerebellar hemisphere. Don't confuse cerebellar with cerebral. Cerebral refers to the cerebrum. Cerebellar refers to the cerebellum. When we open this up and we look at it from the inside or the medial view, it looks like a leaf. The inner part of the leaf, which are the veins of the leaf is white matter. And the outer part, which is the cortex is gray matter. The other name for the cerebellar cortex is called folia, F-O-L-I-A, folia, like foliage, leaves. The inner part, the white matter is called arbor vitae. It means tree of life. Cerebellum deals with 
fine coordination, making sure that your movements are very nicely smooth and controlled. Now we're gonna look at the ventricles and these ventricles are found deep in that diencephalon. And there are four ventricles. So we're gonna take a look. Here are the lateral ventricles or lateral ventricle one and two. From this view, superior view, the lateral ventricles look like this. Lateral ventricles one and two or one and two. There's no delineation between the left being number one or the right being number two. It could be either or, but these are the lateral ventricles and there are two of them. After the cerebral spinal fluid leaves the lateral ventricles, it's got to find a way into the third ventricle and then it's got to find a way into the fourth ventricle. In order to go from the lateral ventricles into the third ventricle, it's got to go through this structure here called the interventricular foramen of Monroe, the interventricular foramen of Monroe. That's how the CSF or cerebral spinal fluid goes from the lateral ventricles, one and two, into the third ventricle. To go from the third ventricle into the fourth ventricle, it's got to go through another duct called the cerebral aqueduct or cerebral aqueduct of Sylvia or Sylvis, same thing. So it goes lateral ventricles one and two. In order for it to get into the third ventricle, it's got to go through the, the foramen of Monroe. To go from the third ventricle into the fourth ventricle, it's got to go through the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius. Now it's in the fourth ventricle, it's got to escape. How does it get out of the fourth ventricle? It goes out through the lateral apertures here and here, or it goes down through the median aperture. When it goes through the median aperture, if you remember the cross section of the spinal cord where the butterfly or the letter H is, right in the center is the central canal, close to that gray commissure. CSF or cerebral spinal fluid also bathes the spinal cord. Okay, now we're gonna be finishing up with this PowerPoint brain, cranial nerves, eye, ear, spinal cord, nerves, and reflex arc. So some of this is somewhat repetitious. So we talked about the thalamus already. Here's the hypothalamus. This is the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain. Here's the cerebellum. Behind or superior, I should say, to the cerebellum is the corpora quadrigemina, the body of four, which is made up of the superior and inferior colliculus. We mentioned the corpus callosum already. We talked about the fornix, we showed you that. This was the septum pellucidum, also the lateral ventricles. The vascular structure was the choroid plexus. This is the thalamus. Whoop, let me go back. This is the thalamus with the interthalamic adhesion, hypothalamus, infundibulum, pituitary. The optic nerves crisscross here, the optic chiasm. That's why if there's a pituitary tumor and that enlarges, it can put pressure along the optic nerve. Medulla, pons, midbrain. Back here is the pineal gland. The pineal gland produces a um, neurotransmitter or hormone that's called melatonin. Here's the pineal gland, thalamus, interthalamic adhesion, hypothalamus. Similar structures, just different model, nothing new. Here's the interthalamic adhesion, thalamus, hypothalamus, infundibulum, pituitary, corpus callosum choroid plexus, pineal gland, corpora quadrigemina, superior and inferior colliculi. Fourth ventricle is right here, anterior to the cerebellum.
nothing new here. Here's the superior colliculus, inferior colliculus, cerebral aqueduct or cerebral aqueduct of Sylvius, bringing cerebral spinal fluid from the third ventricle into the fourth ventricle. Here is the cerebellum. You can see the veins of the cerebellum is the arbor vitae, and then the gray matter around it is the uh, cerebellar cortex, also known as folia. Then you have the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain once again, infundibulum, pituitary. Here are some of the cranial nerves. Again, the two most obvious ones you could see here, cranial nerve number one, this is the olfactory bulb. This is the olfactory tract, AKA the olfactory nerve for sense of smell. Here is the optic nerve and where they crisscross in the center is the optic chiasm. Just drop the A and call it an optic chiasm. Cerebellum is back here and there's your uh, pituitary gland. When this enlarges and you have a pituitary tumor, it can interfere with your vision because the optic tract or cranial nerve number two becomes interfered with. Again, your olfactory nerve. Here's your optic nerve, cranial nerve two, where they crisscross in the center is the optic chiasm, and there's your pituitary gland. In terms of the 12 cranial nerves, you should know them by Roman numeral, one through 12, they are paired. Olfactory, optic, oculomotor, trochlear, trigeminal, abducens, facial, vestibulocochlear, glossopharyngeal, vagus, spinal accessory, and hypoglossal. Cranial nerve one, olfactory, deals with the sense of smell. Cranial nerve number two, optic, is for vision. Cranial nerve three, four, and six move the eye. Cranial nerve three, oculomotor, cranial nerve four, trochlear, and cranial nerve six, abducens, controls the six eye muscles. Remember the six eye muscles, the four rectus and the two obliques? It was a superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus, lateral rectus, superior oblique and inferior oblique. Those are all innervated by those three cranial nerves to move the eye. By the word abducen, you can tell that abduct, that one's gonna move the eye away from the nose laterally. Trigeminal. Trigeminal nerve is cranial nerve five. It is the only cranial nerve that deals with sensation to the face. Part of it is sensory because it does sensation to the face, to the eyes, to the maxillary region and to the mandibular region. And it also controls the muscles of mastication. Mastication means your chewing muscles. Those chewing muscles are the temporalis, the masseter, and the internal and external pterygoid muscles. Those are your chewing muscles, the muscles of mastication. So the trigeminal nerve is both sensory and motor because sensory to your face, this is the cranial nerve that your dentist is gonna hit with Novocaine when they're working on your upper jaw or lower jaw. So you don't feel the pain when they're doing a filling or extracting a tooth. Cranial nerve seven is the facial nerve. This is the cranial nerve that deals with facial expression like smiling, frowning, raising your eyebrows, kissing, blow, puffing up your cheeks, um, all facial. It also deals with not just motor or movement to the face, but it controls the sense of sweet, sour, and salty to the tongue. So cranial nerve seven, seven sweet, sour, salty, seven sweet, sour, salty. It also deals with salivation. So it deals with the salivary glands and it also deals with uh, lacrimation, part of your uh, tear duct. Vestibulocochlear, cranial nerve eight, Vestibulocochlear. Cochlear is for hearing. Vestibular is for balance. When I go over the ear, I'll show you more carefully the vestibular portion and the cochlear portion. 
Vestibular cochlear nerve is cranial nerve number eight. V with three ones. Vestibular deals with balance. Cochlear deals with hearing. Glossopharyngeal, the muscles of the back of the throat to help you swallow. And also deals with the gag reflex. Cranial nerve 10, vagal nerve. The vagus nerve uh, begins in the medulla oblongata. It's protected by the C1 and C2 vertebrae. And it innervates every major organ of the body. It's sensory and motor to every organ, the heart, the lungs, the stomach, the kidneys, the spleen, the liver, the intestines. It all is innervated by the vagal nerve. And the, the nerve comes from the word vagrant, like a wanderer, a person who's vagrant wanders around. And if you look at um, the vagal nerve, you'll see that it wanders to about 90% of the human body. It's one of the reasons why I love being a doctor of chiropractic so much. It's by stimulating the C1 vertebrae or the atlas or axis where the medulla is, we can influence organ function to about 90% of the human body, just from that one nerve, vagal. Cranial nerve number 11 is the spinal accessory nerve, and that controls the sternocleidomastoid, the SCM, and the trapezius muscle. And then the hypoglossal, hypo, under, glossal, tongue, under the tongue, it moves the tongue in a variety of uh, directions. Let's take a look at the eye now and go over some of the main parts of the eye. When we look at the eye, the black portion is the pupil, the colored portion is the iris. So my iris is green, I have green eyes, some people have brown, some blue, some black. So the iris is the colored portion. The sclera is the white portion. And the sclera is continuous with the, um, let me show you here. Can't see it from this view, but we can see it from this view here. So if you look at the cornea, which is the clear part, the cornea is continuous with the sclera, which is the white part. Okay. The iris is the colored part and the pupil can dilate or constrict. And then look, you can see the muscles here, those muscles that we learned about when we did muscles, superior rectus and lateral rectus and medial rectus and inferior rectus and inferior oblique and the superior oblique, those are the six eye muscles. Here is the lacrimal gland, which is superior and lateral. Here's the nose. This is where tears, cranial nerve nine, is involved with um, lacrimation. So cranial nerve nine and seven are involved here. It helps tears roll down to the inner eye, cleans the eye, and now the tears roll right here into the um, lacrimal canal and then into the nose. And because the tears are pretty dirty and loaded with histamine, the inner nose swells and you get that nasally sound, the congested sound. That's why when people cry, their nose gets stuffed. When we look at the eye, again, we can see from the lateral view, here's the cornea, the translucent clear part. It's continuous with the sclera. You can see the sclera here. You can see the cornea here. You can see the muscles here. Here's the pupil. Here's the iris. The sclera is the outermost layer of the eye. When we move in, we could see the vascular layer. The vascular layer is called the choroid, the brown layer, that's called a choroid. We can also see the anterior compartment, which is just posterior to the cornea, and then it stops right here at the lens. This is the lens. Here's another view of it from the inside, on the bottom left. Then we have this vitreous humor that's contained in the posterior compartment, whereas we have an aqueous humor in the anterior compartment. Sclera is the outermost layer, choroid, the middle layer, and the innermost layer of the eye is called the retina. The retina 
contains the receptors of the eye for color and black and white vision. Here's the iris, pupil, sclera, the outermost layer is the sclera, which would be continuous with the, uh, if we go back here, so we can show you the cornea. The cornea is continuous with the sclera. The, the cornea is, that's kind of removed here. You could see the sclera and the middle layer, which is the vascular layer, that's the choroid. Again, sclera. Now you could see three layers a little bit. You could see the sclera, choroid, and then the innermost layer, retina. Pupil, half the pupil, iris, lens. Behind the lens is the vitreous humor. It's a gelatinous type of a jelly-like liquid substance. You can see that what's holding the lens in place, it fits into this little cavity here. And what's holding it is the ciliary muscle. The ciliary muscle attaches to the lens and has these stringy like ligaments that attach to it that can alter the shape of the lens, can alter your vision. That lens sits right here in this little cavity. From this view, we can see the three layers of the eye. The sclera is the outermost layer. Again, continuous with the cornea. Cornea, sclera, middle layer, vascular, choroid, innermost, retina. And that's where in the retina is where the receptors for all of your vision lie. And then it will relay that visual input into the optic nerve which goes back into the superior colliculus and back to the occipital lobe of the brain. Here is the cornea in the front. Here's the pupil. Here's the lens. You can see the ciliary muscle with its suspensory ligaments attaching to the lens that can alter its shape, right? That holds the lens in place. Again, cornea continuous with the sclera, middle layer, choroid, innermost layer, retina. The optic disc is that region in the back of the eye where the arteries, the veins, and the nerves travel right through. It's the only part of the body that you can see arteries, veins, and nerves without dissecting the human body. We can use a fundoscope, shine light, I look in a person's eye and I can look at their blood vessels and the nerve. We could pick up a lot of metabolic diseases simply by looking at the ratio between the size of the arteries, the diameter of the arteries and the veins. We could pick up if a person is diabetic or not simply by looking into the eye and looking at these blood vessels. Again, you could see the iris, the pupil, the lens. These were the eye muscles that we covered when we covered the muscles. Superior rectus on the bottom was the inferior rectus, lateral rectus, medial rectus, superior oblique, and the inferior oblique. These six muscles are the ones that are innervated by cranial nerve three, four, and six. Oculomotor nerve, trochlear nerve, and abducens nerve, three, four, and six. Let's take a look at the ear and understand how we hear. So the outer part of the ear is called the pina or the oracle. Think of it as a funnel. And this is where the sound waves come in to the outer part of the funnel. And the vibration of those air waves or the sound waves are bouncing through the external auditory meatus. When it hits the meatus, the, the sound waves are gonna bang up against the eardrum, which is the tympanic membrane. When the sound bounces and hits the tympanic membrane, it's like hitting the drum, an instrument called a drum. So the tympanic membrane is now vibrating. 
And when this thing oscillates and vibrates, it's going to shake and rattle these three bones, the malus, the incus, and the stapes. When these three bones vibrate back and forth, the stapes attaches to this area of the vestibule. This dilated part of the snail is called a vestibule. And it's going to oscillate back and forth. When it oscillates back and forth, it's going to create this back and forth movement of liquid and fluid inside the cochlea. The cochlea is responsible for hearing. The vestibule is responsible for balance. So we have the vestibulo cochlear nerve, cranial nerve eight. The cochlear portion is for hearing, vestibular portion is for hearing. There are, little, there are these little hair-like structures that are moved and vibrated inside the cochlea in a part called the organ of corti. The organ of corti is the sensory receptor for sound. And it is then translated from the cochlea or the organ of corti into the cochlear nerve, into the temporal lobe, and voila, you can hear. The vestibule has these semicircular canals. There's the anterior canal, the posterior canal, and the lateral canal. And there's liquid in here too. But this liquid moves back and forth depending on the movement of your head. It works like a carpenter tool, like the bubble that's in that liquid that a carpenter puts on a shelf to see is the shelf straight or is the picture frame straight. So the liquid in here in the bubble moves the little hairs in the semicircular canals and tells your body that you're moving your head forward, backward, or turning your head left and right. So again, starting from the left, you have the external auditory meatus. The sound hits the tympanic membrane. It vibrates the malus, the incus, and the stapes. You have the oval window that oscillates back and forth. And then it starts to create this movement of the liquid and fluid inside the cochlea. Inside of there is called the organ of corti. It relays that vibrational message into a neurological frequency, and it goes up into the temporal lobe of the brain. So it's called the vestibular cochlear nerve. This is the cochlea portion. This is the vestibule. This is the vestibular nerve. This is the anterior canal, the posterior canal, and the lateral canal. Depending on how you move your head in a particular position, if you move your head forward, the anterior canal gets stimulated. If you extend your head back, the posterior canal gets stimulated. If you turn your head left and right, then the lateral canal gets stimulated. Let's take a look at the inner ear again. Here is the external auditory meatus. This is your tympanic membrane that oscillates back and forth. It vibrates like an eardrum. Here's the malus, incus, and stapes. The stapes attaches to the oval window of the vestibule. This thing oscillates back and forth, creates a vibration inside the cochlear and the organ of corti. The cochlea relays the message to the cochlear portion of the vestibulocochlear nerve. Here's the vestibular portion going to the vestibule. And these are the semicircular canals that deals with balance. Anterior canal, posterior canal, lateral canal. You can see the canals here. Here's the tympanic membrane, malus, incus, stapes, oval window, vestibule, anterior canal, posterior canal, lateral canal. Here's the cochlea, cochlea nerve, vestibular nerve goes to the vestibule. When you tilt your head forward, the anterior canal gets stimulated. When you extend your head back, posterior canal, when you turn your head left and right, the lateral canals. This is involved in vertigo. When mom or dad or grandma, or grandpa turn their head or they roll over in bed and they feel very dizzy and they get that, they feel like everything is spinning, that is vertigo. That's when a crystal gets lodged and stuck in one of these semicircular canals and it's constantly stimulating the nervous system and the person thinks they're moving. 
that that crystal has to find its way back into the vestibule, an area here called the ampulla, which is a dilated part of the vestibule. When these crystals get lodged in here, the person gets a type of vertigo that's stimulated when they change the position of their body or their head, and it's called benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Mom rolls over to the left, and then she feels dizzy. A uh, person rotates their head to the right, and everything feels like it's spinning. That is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, fixable in about five minutes. I have fixed many of these, takes about five minutes. It is a mechanical maneuver that needs to be done. Most medical physicians simply put patients on uh, motion sickness medication, which doesn't really help too much. And people are on it for years and years and years, not thinking there's a, a really a mechanical solution. And I fix at least, I don't know, 10 or 12 of these a year minimum um, in five minutes or less. Doesn't take long. Okay, this one you've already done. So this is a, a good image for you to test yourself. This is the spinal cord with the cross section of the spine, the vertebra there. And again, you can self test because these would be the answers or you can use these numbers with the answers down below. We did this last week. Um, same, we did that. There's nothing new here. We covered the axon. Uh, we said the three main parts are the dendrites, the axon, and the cell body or soma. The white portions here, these extensions are dendrites. It brings input into the cell body and carries the neurological message out through the axon. A for away, it sends the message away. Notice the axon is here in the center and it's protected or insulated by myelin. Myelin is produced by the Schwann cells in the peripheral neural system or the oligodendrocytes in the central neural system. So this right here is nothing other than a nucleus of a Schwann cell, but these Schwann cells produce the fat or cholesterol-like insulation to protect these axons. Between this Schwann cell and this Schwann cell, there's this invagination here. There's another invagination right here. Those invaginations are called nodes of Ranvier. It's how the action potential skips through saltatory conduction from node to node or Schwann cell to Schwann cell. And then here is the endoneurium that connective tissue layer that surrounds the axon here. This is myelin, but external to the myelin is the endoneurium. These are filled with neurotransmitters. These are the axon terminals. The axon terminal is filled with a neurotransmitter and neurotransmitters could be either excitatory or inhibitory chemical messengers. And you remember the reflex arc we did last week there's the receptor, there's the sensory neuron, AKA afferent neuron or fiber. Then it relays it to the interneuron, AKA association neuron. And then it relays that information to the motor neuron, AKA efferent neuron or efferent fiber. And its final destination is called the effector. So you have receptor, sensory neuron is yellow, Motor neuron is orange, the interneuron is green, and the effector in this case is the muscle known as the effector.